as revolutionary and controversial as the origin of species was. The obvious topic it did not cover, is the evolution of humans. All Darwin offered there was a vague note that, eventually, light would be thrown on the origin of man and his history. At the time of its publication, in 1859, there was virtually no fossil evidence for human evolution. Yet Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection suggested that all species could be understood in terms of descent with modification. The logical conclusion was that humans too, evolved from ancestors different from current-day humans. The first person to make this point, at least in print, was Thomas Henry Huxley, known as Darwin's Bulldog for his fierce advocacy and defense of evolution through natural selection. Huxley's 1863 book, Evidence as to Man's Place in Nature pointed out the anatomical similarities between humans and great apes like gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans. Like humans, apes have forward-facing eyes, large brains for the size of our bodies, and lack tails. The structure of our feet and hands are very similar, too. Including fingernails instead of claws. To Huxley, these similarities suggest common ancestry between humans and great apes. But despite the similarities, it was clear that humans are different from gorillas and chimpanzees in important ways. For one thing, humans walk upright on two legs. While chimps can walk upright for short distances, which they sometimes do when their hands are full, they aren't very good at it. Their hips won't allow them to balance on one foot, so they have to lean from side to side with each step, making their motion less efficient. What's more, their backbones, pelvis and knees all are not well suited for upright walking. Another difference, is, body hair, even the hairiest humans have much less body hair than chimpanzees and gorillas. And, of course, there is the human brain. While apes have larger brains than most mammals, the human brain is exceptionally large for our body size. Compared to the brain of a chimpanzee or gorilla, the human brain is three times larger. And along with the difference in brain size comes dramatic differences in the cognitive abilities of humans and chimpanzees. Including the ability to make and use complex tools and the ability to communicate through symbolic language. Despite these differences, Huxley argued that humans must have once shared a common ancestor with the great apes. Yet, at the time, there was very little physical evidence for intermediate stages between humans and a chimpanzee-like ancestor. One possible clue that Huxley discussed came from the fragment of a skull and a few limb bones found in a mine in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf, Germany. Although these would later be described as belonging to our close relatives, the Neanderthals, or Homo neanderthalensis. Their age and importance was not apparent when they were first described in 1857. Besides, the Neanderthal bones appeared much more human-like than ape-like. Darwin expanded on Huxley's ideas about human evolution in his 1871 book The Descent of Man. Like Huxley, Darwin saw the similarities between humans and apes as evidence for their close evolutionary relationships. As additional evidence, Darwin pointed to early stages in development in which a human fetus has structures that are found in other animals, like a tail. Darwin also acknowledged that the lack of a fossil record linking humans to apes was problematic, but speculated that fossils of human ancestors would eventually be found. He even predicted that such fossils would likely come from Africa, where great ape diversity is highest. Darwin was right. Many fossil remains of human ancestors have since been discovered. He was also correct in his prediction that the oldest human fossils would be found in Africa. But what Darwin did not know was just how many different types of human-like species, or hominins, once existed. These discoveries, as well as insights gained from sequencing DNA from ancient remains, have led evolutionary biologists to leave behind the old, iconic image of human evolution, popularized by Huxley, of a linear progression from hunched ape to upright human. In its place, we now have enough information to draw a phylogeny, or evolutionary tree, for humans and our closest living and extinct relatives. This depiction of human evolution resembles what Darwin would have wanted, with many splits, each leading to a series of branches that represent the different species of hominins. We can think of each branch as a natural experiment in how to make a human.
The use of DNA sequence data has provided a powerful new way to compare the genomes of humans and great apes, and thereby reconstruct our own evolutionary tree. Our closest living relatives are chimpanzees. Next closest are gorillas and then orangutans. While the last common ancestor of all four lived around 10 million years ago, we shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees until as recently as 5 to 7 million years ago. Around that time there was a speciation event that gave rise to two lineages. One would lead to chimpanzees, the other would be the hominins, some of whom eventually become humans. We don't know all of the characteristics of our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. As for hominins, the first thing to notice is that there wasn't a simple transition from one species of hominin to another, leading ultimately to Homo sapiens. Rather, the fossil evidence shows that many hominin species were alive at the same time. We don't yet know the exact relationships between each of the species, meaning that we can't trace a line of direct descent from the common ancestor we shared with chimpanzees directly to us. And yet somewhere on this tree, a transition occurred that separates animal from human. That's part of what makes the evolutionary tree of hominins, is, one of the most profound images in all of science. Think about it. Can we draw a line and say that on one side are non-humans and on the other side are humans? Where would the line be? Did we become human when we started walking upright? Or when we developed language or art or religion? Was it the ability to harness fire? Or was it the ability to make complex tools that made us human? The other thing that blows my mind and I like to imagine would have blown Darwin's too is how just many species of hominin have existed. There were somewhere around 15, depending on what source you consider and which species definition you favor. The fact that many of these species were alive at the same time and the same place, or at least nearby, means that many of these species likely interacted. What it would have been like to live in a world with multiple human or human-like species? What would we think of them? As allies or foes? Or maybe both? In most animal species especially most primates an encounter with a different species is usually dangerous. Chimpanzees are known to hunt and eat monkeys. And for example when a wolf encounters a coyote, the coyote often becomes, lunch. On the other hand, the occurrence of hybrids between closely distinct but related species sometimes can result successful reproduction. Like ligers. The hybrid offspring of a lion and a tiger. What caused there to be so many different human species? All of the forces of evolution mutation, natural and sexual selection, gene flow, and genetic drift led to repeated episodes of speciation. Each species had a different ecological niche, with its own advantages and disadvantages given its environment. And yet, out of all this diversity, only one species, Homo sapiens would survive. If we think of these different types of humans as natural experiments in human evolution, then what can we learn from the outcome of these experiments? Why were we the species that survived and not another? Why not many others? To understand why, let's take a deeper look at what we've learned about hominins since Darwin's lifetime. One of the oldest members of the hominin family is Ardipithecus ramidus, which lived about 4.4 million years ago. The fossilized remains of a skull and parts of the lower body were first discovered in Ethiopia during the early 1990s by Tim White and his colleagues. Since then, more than 100 additional specimens of this species have been discovered. The overall appearance of Ardipithecus ramidus is more chimp-like than human-like. Its skull shows that it had a relatively small brain, about the same size as a chimpanzee. But the shape of its pelvis suggests that it had begun to walk upright at least some of the time, although not as effectively as modern humans. One of the most famous fossil hominins was discovered by Donald Johansson and his colleagues in Hadar, Ethiopia, on November 24, 1974. The team celebrated that evening at their field site by dancing to the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. The song prompted the team to nickname the fossil, Lucy. Lucy belonged to the species Australopithecus afarensis. Johansson and his team uncovered parts of the skull and much of the body as well, which helped resolve a long-standing debate about whether walking on two feet evolved before or after our big brains. 
Lucy had a skull about the same size as a chimpanzee, but her pelvis, backbone, knee, and foot clearly showed that she was capable of walking upright in much the same way as modern humans. A later discovery in Tanzania of preserved footprints helped confirm that Australopithecus afarensis walked on two feet. The position of the toes in front of the foot, the short length of the toes, and the presence of an arch, all indicate a foot that resembled ours more than that of a chimpanzee. While the discovery of Lucy and others of her species made it clear that walking upright evolved before the evolution of a larger brain. The question of why our ancestors began walking upright still remained. Biologist Dan Lieberman thinks the answer may have to do with another peculiarity of humans. Our sweat. Compared with chimpanzees and other apes, humans have far more sweat glands distributed over our bodies. But what does this have to do with walking upright? Sweat helps the body cool down, especially during intense activity like running. Humans are not very fast in a sprint, but we are able to keep running at modest speeds for much longer than most mammals, thanks in part to our ability to cool down by sweating. Lieberman's research suggests a method called persistence hunting, which is used by some modern indigenous peoples, may have been used by early hominins as well. Persistence hunting works like this. If you run towards an animal, like an antelope, it will of course run away. An antelope is faster in a sprint than any human, but it will eventually stop running. It has to because it must cool down by panting, which it can't do while galloping. If a person can keep up with the antelope enough to keep it from stopping for long to cool down, the antelope will eventually overheat and collapse. At that point, it becomes an easy target for a club or a spear. By two million years ago, hominins had evolved to be fully bipedal, meaning they walked and ran on two feet just as well as modern humans. But they still had relatively small brains. Consider one of the first members of our genus, Homo erectus. Homo erectus had a body that looked a lot like a modern human. It had a larger brain than Australopithecus, and probably made stone tools, both of which suggest a much greater level of intelligence. Homo erectus is the first member of the human lineage to leave Africa, spreading as far as Southeast Asia. In fact, the first remains of what is now recognized as Homo erectus were discovered by Eugene Dubois on the Indonesian island of Java in 1891. We are still learning how far Homo erectus traveled. But the shocking discovery of Homo floresiensis in 2003 on the Indonesian island of Flores suggests that some Homo erectus may have crossed the open ocean. What researchers discovered, just inside the entrance to a cave called Liang Bua were the remains of perhaps a dozen individuals, including a mostly complete skull. Despite being fully grown adults, they stood only about three feet, six inches tall, which earned them the nickname Hobbits after the characters in Tolkien's novels. Researchers believe that the Hobbits are descendants of a small group of Homo erectus that became stranded and evolved island dwarfism, much like the pygmy elephants found on many islands. This discovery was puzzling because radiometric dating of the sediments surrounding the fossil suggested it lived between 100,000 and 60,000 years ago. But the bones had an unexpected combination of features, including a relatively small brain and wrist bones that are more typical of chimpanzees and older hominin species. Hominin evolution involved radiations in all directions, geographic and anatomical, not just a single line. Back in Africa, brain size was slowly increasing until about 800,000 years ago, when it suddenly began to increase rapidly. We can imagine how increased intelligence could have been beneficial, but why did it suddenly happen beginning 800,000 years ago? Interestingly, the rapid brain size increase in hominins coincided with a period of extreme climate fluctuation. It is possible that an unstable climate meant that individuals with larger brains and greater intelligence had a survival advantage. Exactly when and where, our species, Homo sapiens, first appeared, is a source of constant debate among experts. A study published in 2017 described fossil skulls and jaw bones from a site in Morocco that date to approximately 315,000 years ago. These authors claimed that these fossils represent the oldest remains found yet of Homo sapiens. 
but other experts don't agree that the Moroccan material should be considered Homo sapiens, noting the lack of a human chin and an overly prominent forehead. Fossils more widely accepted as Homo sapiens have been found in East Africa, including 196,000-year-old specimens from Ethiopia. Several additional discoveries suggest that our species lived alongside other human species. In 2013, explorers deep inside Rising Star Cave in South Africa discovered a chamber containing fossil bones. They took pictures of the bones and showed them to anthropologists, including Lee Berger. Berger assembled a team of experts to return to the cave in 2013 and 2014, where they found more than 1,500 fossils from at least 15 individuals that Berger and his colleagues described as a new species, Homo naledi. The Homo naledi fossils had hands and feet that looked like modern humans, but their skulls and teeth were closer to those of early Homo species, like Homo erectus. The brain was especially small, more like that of Australopithecus. Radiometric dating suggested these semi-human Homo naledi fossils were between 335,000 and 236,000 years old, suggesting they were around at the same time as our species was coming into existence. While we don't yet know how our species interacted with Homo naledi, a discovery in another cave more than 6,000 miles away revealed at least one way we interacted with other human species. In 2000, a tooth was found in a cave near the town of Denisova in southern Siberia. Also in the same cave, a piece of finger bone was found in 2008. Because of the cold, dry climate, the bones were well preserved, allowing pieces of intact DNA to be recovered from the bones by ancient DNA expert Svante Pabo. Initial study of mitochondrial DNA was enough to determine that the bones represented a previously unknown group of humans, and were given the name Denisovans. The mitochondrial DNA sequence showed that Denisovans were distinct from Homo sapiens, and most closely related to Neanderthals. In 2012, Svante Pabo and his team published the results of a complete genome analysis based on the DNA extracted from the Denisovan fossils. Their study also included a big surprise. By comparing the Denisovan genome with the genome of modern humans, they found that modern humans have Denisovan DNA. Specifically, modern people today who trace their ancestry to regions outside of Africa have as much as 5% Denisovan DNA. Mysteriously, the highest percentages come from New Guinea and the Southwest Pacific Islands. While we don't yet understand the reasons for the geographic distribution of Denisovan ancestry, one thing is clear. As our ancestors spread out of Africa and encountered other human species like Denisovans, they had sex with them. The result of these trysts were babies that were raised, survived to adulthood, and had children of their own. Additional studies by Pabo's group showed that modern humans also have DNA from European Neanderthals. While we can't know exactly what encounters between these different species of humans were like, including whether the sexual encounters were consensual, the fact that the encounters involved sex suggests a closer relationship than between humans and animals. In other words, we saw these other species as people. The populations of many large mammals shrank some 70,000 years ago. The eruption of the Toba volcano on the Indonesian island of Sumatra sent enough ash into the atmosphere that it likely disrupted the Earth's climate for several years. Humans were among the many casualties, and we nearly became extinct. Comparisons of modern human genomes show that all humans living today appear to descend from a population bottleneck of only 10,000 individuals that lived about 70,000 years ago. So, humans just barely avoided the sort of extinction vortex that wiped out a lot of other large animals, including all the other humans. We became the lone survivors, the only descendants from a widespread and diverse group unlike anything that had previously existed on Earth. Our closest relatives have all become extinct. But our evolution did not stop with the origin of our species, Homo sapiens. As we spread around the world, our ancestors adapted to new environments. Some of the results of those evolutionary changes can still be seen in people living today. 
One example is a people from different regions of the world differ in how much of the pigment eumelanin their skin cells produce, resulting in lighter or darker colored skin. If we look at how the intensity of sunlight varies in different parts of the earth, it matches very well with the average amount of eumelanin people have in those regions. We now understand the distribution of eumelanin in human skin as an adaptation to varying levels of sunlight. Eumelanin acts as a natural sunscreen, so having more of it is advantageous in regions where sunlight is very intense, like in the tropics and at high altitudes where the air is thinner. Ultraviolet light from the sun causes damage to DNA, which is why too much sun exposure can lead to skin cancer. But ultraviolet light also breaks down folate, an important B vitamin that is needed to copy DNA every time a cell divides. A developing fetus is constantly dividing its cells as it grows, so it needs to make a lot of copies of its DNA. Protection from sunlight by eumelanin can help ensure cell division goes smoothly. In other words, having more eumelanin was favored by natural selection in places with intense sunlight. In regions where sunlight is less intense, like northern Europe, having too much eumelanin can become a liability. That's because exposure to adequate levels of sunlight are needed to make vitamin D, which helps the body absorb calcium. Once again, this is important for a developing fetus that is growing a skeleton built largely of calcium. But we can see evidence for the history of natural selection on skin pigmentation in some of the genes responsible for differences in eumelanin production. One example is a gene called SLC24A5, which is located on chromosome number 15. SLC24A5 shows a strong signal of having been subjected to natural selection, particularly in Europe where skin color evolved to be lighter over the course of several thousand years. So, natural selection favored producing less eumelanin in regions with less intense sunlight, leading to a healthy baby. A variety of human evolutionary experiments were all running and interacting when a catastrophe 70,000 years ago created a bottleneck from which only a small portion of hominin survived. With similar bottlenecks, or even extinctions, for many other large mammals. Ironically, that catastrophe, like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, may have opened more opportunities for the survivors to use their sharpened abilities and expand, as never before, 